What is MIMO SVD communications? Well, the multiple input, multiple output part corresponds to a transmitter having multiple antenna elements and the receiver, which is the output of the channel having multiple antenna elements as well. So that's the MIMO. We'll come to the SVD in a minute. But let's think about this transmitter. It's a single user that has divided its data stream that it wants to send into N sub data streams. And you could transmit that data stream off antenna one and this data stream off antenna two and so on. And these X's represent the complex numbers that are going to be sent. These are the constellation points. And for more details about modulation and constellation diagrams, uh, you can check out the description below. We've got lots of videos on the channel explaining these concepts. So if you did just connect these straight through, then each of these elements is going to radiate that constellation point, that symbol, and it's going to be propagated through the channel. And because it's a wireless channel, all of the antennas at the receiver are going to receive each one of those signals. So there'll be a path from antenna one to receiver one, and we call this H11. There'll be a path from antenna one to receiver two, and we call this H21, and so on. And so this path down here will be path HMN. And we can put all of these elements into a matrix and we call this matrix H, where the first index is for the row and the second index is for the column. And if we did connect the first data stream directly to this antenna and the second and so on, then and, and then we put these uh, outputs directly to our outputs here, we would have an equation if Y is a vector of these streams here, Y would equal H times X plus, there's a noise term. And the noise is coming about from the amplifiers in each of these receive antenna elements. Okay, so now what would we be doing? With We got Y and we'd like to get an estimate of X. We wanna work out what the data was in each of these data streams from the transmitter. Well, if you could measure the channel, and if you knew that at the receiver, then you could try to invert the channel. And again, there's videos on the channel, uh, on this YouTube channel, there's videos explaining receiver designs. One of the things if you're going to try to invert the channel is the channel can only be inverted if this matrix is square. And so that's not very practical in many cases. There's lots of situations where the channel is not square. For example, in mobile communications to a base station, the base station is large and can have lots of antenna elements, but the user terminal might be a mobile phone, which is small and can't have very many. So for example, on the downlink, then the transmitter side would have lots of antenna elements because that would be the base station transmitting downlink to the mobile phone. But on the uplink, the receiver will be the side that has lots of antenna elements because the base station is receiving a signal coming up from a small mobile phone. So we need to know what we can do when H is not square. So let's think about the singular value decomposition of H and see if that can help us. So here we have a decomposition of H, which is called the singular value decomposition, where U and V are unitary matrices and D is a diagonal matrix. What does unitary mean? Well, it means that if we take U, for example, U times U star, which is the complex conjugate transpose, equals U star U, which equals the identity. So U star is the inverse of U. That's a special property of unitary matrices. Now note that I said that D was a diagonal matrix. Well, in fact, it's not going to be a square diagonal. It will be a rectangular diagonal because U is M by M and V is N by N. So D is going to be M by N. So this is not a square matrix, but it is called rectangular diagonal. We'll give a couple of examples in a minute. Uh, on those diagonal elements though, are the singular values. So these are the diagonal elements and we call them sigma i. Uh, these are non-negative and real. That's a property of the singular value decomposition. Okay, so how does this 
decomposition help us in our communications uh, problem with MIMO communications? Well, let's look at the equation that we get if we replace H with this decomposition. So now we have Y equals this version of H, this way of writing H times X plus N. We haven't done anything yet to change the system. But now we can start thinking about what we might be able to do in between these modulation symbols and the actual transmit antennas. And let's put an operation in here, which we're going to do in the digital domain. We're going to take these symbols, which are complex numbers, and before we transmit them, we're going to multiply them by the matrix V. Uh, and you can see that's going to put the matrix V into this equation here. And think about the unitary nature, because it's unitary, then we will have V star V, which will give us the identity. So that will effectively cancel out this part of the channel matrix. So we're doing pre-coding, we call it pre-coding, to cancel out a component of the channel here. So this is, of course, the channel. And now we're doing this operation here before we transmit our symbols. And at the receiver, we're going to do a similar operation before we uh, have our final symbols that we're going to use to try to estimate the inputs. And this is by multiplying by U star in the receiver. Of course, that means we're also going to be multiplying the noise by U star because, again, the noise is in the amplifiers in the receive antenna elements. So now we have this equation here, and of course, using the property of the unit tree here, we have that this equals simply D times X plus U star times N. Okay, so now what we've got is we've got our input data, our input symbols, complex number symbols, and now, once we've done these, uh, these operations here, are now effectively going through a diagonal channel. Let's just think about this for a minute, especially for the fact that I said that we don't have an equal number of antennas at the transmitter and the receiver. So M does not equal N. Let's think about those scenarios. So let's think about when M is less than N. Then here, for example, if we had two by four in this example here, so M equals two and N equals four, then the diagonal matrix here, which is this rectangular diagonal, will be of this form here. So the the singular values will be on the diagonal, but there are only two of them, and the rest of the matrix is filled with zero. So it's a two by four matrix, and the rest of them are zero. So if we think about this matrix multiplication, the first output Y1 is going to be given by the first singular value times X1, and then zeros are multiplying the others. And the second one will be the second singular value times X2, and these mul zeros multiplying the others. So we can see here, if we have this scenario here, any data that we put onto channels three and four will not be being received at the receiver. And that's an important thing for us to think about when we're putting data into our data streams. Uh, what about the other case when M is greater than N? Then we have, of course, four by two here. Uh, and so our H matrix is going to have these same singular values on the diagonal. But now you can see we've got four received values in the Ys, but we've only got two transmit antennas. In this case, when it's four by two, there's only two transmit antennas. And so we've only got two data streams. These last two receive values for Y2, uh, Y3 two, Y and Y4 will be zeros. You can see they're going to be zero, zero times that vector, zero, zero times that vector. So nothing will come out on there except for noise. So what we can see then is really we only have the number of channels going through, which is the minimum out of M and N. And so that's what we call over here alpha, which is the minimum of M and N. And now we have an effective channel, which looks like this, where the input data streams are going straight through parallel channels because we have diagonalized the channel. And so X1 will go straight through with sigma 1 multiplying by sigma 1 to get y1, of course, plus noise, x2 the same through sigma 2, and, of, and importantly, we go up to x alpha to y alpha, where alpha is this minimum because of what we've seen over here. So just to remind ourselves here, we are using all of the antennas at both the transmitter and the receiver, even if we have fewer data streams 
than the number of antennas at whichever end has the most antennas. It's not that we're not using those antennas, we are using those antennas. But our data streams are now, because of the pre-coding and the receiver matrix operation, uh, those data streams are now going through effective channels that are parallel to each other. So something important to note in this diagonalized channel is that each of our data streams from the transmitter is going to go through a different gain, which means we'll have a different signal to noise ratio for each of our data streams. And that means that we'll have different performance for each of our data streams. So then we might think, well, how do we try to uh, manage this so that we get a constant performance or the performance that we'd like on all of them? And so one thing that we could do, for example, when these are ordered, where if this is the highest gain to the lowest gain, uh, for example, we might think to do what we call bit loading, where on the channel with the least gain, we might use modulation format here, for example, just BPSK. So maybe we only try to send one bit for every symbol when we're on that subchannel by sending BPSK, where the constellation points are far apart. So they go through the channel that has the least gain, these constellation points will be attenuated, um, but because they start off far apart, you'll still be able to get good bit error rate, but you're only sending one bit per symbol. Whereas on the better channel, maybe you on this one uh, choose to use, say for example, 16 QAM, where you're sending four bits per symbol. So this is called bit loading, and this is something that you can do in SVD communications. So on the channels that are getting a good gain, you put a high constellation, uh, a compact constellation with lots of um, data points, which corresponds to many bits, in this case, four bits. And on the weak channels, you put just a low constellation rate. Another thing that you could do is you could put different power on each of these in your transmitter. So we could put a, we have, a, of course, a total power budget across all of our data streams, but there's nothing to say that we have to put equal power into each of these, just like there wasn't anything to say that we had to use the same constellation in each of them. So we could put power one on data stream one, for example, and power two on data stream two and so on. And this will correspond in our block diagram above to including a diagonal power matrix. And that will put a power matrix in here and a power matrix in here. These are just diagonal matrices, which means you can do power loading. And uh, this will be solved in terms of which what powers you put on of these. You can solve this with water filling. And again, there's video on the channel on water filling. So check out the description below. In this case, though, you do have to be careful because the uh, limit is uh, on power is not just the total power, but it's the limit for each of the antenna elements because each of these antennas has its own RF amplifier, power amplifier. And each of those power amplifiers has a specific dynamic range. So you need to make sure that your data streams, the power that you're wanting to put on each of these data streams, when it goes through the precoder V, you need to make sure that it doesn't uh, come out with spikes on particular uh, output antenna elements. Um, pretty sure that it won't in general because it's a unitary transformation, the V, which doesn't change the norm of the vector. Uh, but it could be that it rotates the vector in such a way that you do get peaks on particular antenna elements and you do have to be careful about that uh, in terms of the transmission. So if this has given you more insights into SVD communications, please give the video a thumbs up, like it, it helps others to find the video. Of course, subscribe to the channel for more videos. And as I've said, check out the description below. You'll find a web page there that has a full categorized listing of all the videos on the channel.